next talk, which is a very important talk, is is also very uh, similar. But I'm going to let um, Amish Chada uh, introduce the people in the next talk. But uh, it, it also um, involves people who know what they're talking about in terms of um, uh, the reality on the ground, so to speak. So take it away, Amish. Thank you, Rob, and thank you for the opportunity to lead the panel. Uh, I'm going to start with a few introductions here. Uh, we're joined today by Richa Shrivastav, who is a managing partner at Makers Asylum, which has really been at the forefront of the maker community in India and a leader for the M19 Collective. It's a multidisciplinary collection of maker spaces, community organizations, foundations, industries, universities, researchers, and a range of individuals really making a collaborative effort to foster open innovation, especially open hardware in India. Uh, we saw a great presentation earlier in the technical track where Vebov showed the progress they've been making with their design on the oxygen concentrator. Uh, Richard also has extensive grassroots experience at the private and public sector level, notably in the state of Andhra Pradesh, driving technology investments in the areas of telecom, fintech, and blockchain. Uh, our other panelist, Leith Greens Greensdale, uh, is a senior advisor to several global health and development organizations. She's joining us today as co-founder and coordinator of the Every Breath Counts Coalition. That's an alliance of 50 organizations from the public, private, and nonprofit sectors working together to help low and middle income country governments reduce deaths from pneumonia, including from COVID-19. Uh, she's a proud member of the Every Woman, Every Child movement. She served on the boards of Team Fund, Gabi, the US Vaccine Alliance, and is vice chair with the MDG Health Alliance. She also brings extensive policy development experience working on critical health and social security ministerial portfolios with the Australian government. And the third member of the panel is Florin Georgi, uh, who was in the technical track earlier. As mentioned, he's an innovation specialist with UNICEF, focused on oxygen concentrators and bubble CPAP devices. He spent the past decade deeply involved with the development and commercialization of radically affordable medical devices for low and middle income countries, most notably a CEO and co-founder of Arbutus Medical. Uh, he's also been a notable advisor on digital health initiatives with provincial health authorities in the Canadian healthcare space. So welcome to all of you. Uh, we're going to be zeroing in on India as a case study. Uh, Amish, allow me to interrupt. I'm sorry, I forgot to inter introduce you. So, um, uh, Amish may have some more things to say about uh, who he is, but he is the Chief Risk Officer of Helpful Engineering. Helpful Engineering is a nonprofit which is distinct but very aligned with public invention. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, we're gonna be zeroing in on India as a case study with a particular focus on how we tackle supply chain risk, ensure rigor around build quality and engineer scalable designs that support effective technology transfer to the places that need it most. Uh, Richa, I'd like to start with you. There's been a lot in the media over the last few weeks. We've heard about supply chain issues. We've had healthcare planning issues. We've had the biggest issue around credibility with the black market, with supplies not getting where they need to be. How do we begin to break down our understanding of the oxygen problem in India, given how it's been covered in the media and steer towards constructive outcomes? Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Amish, uh, for the introduction and really uh, excited to be here to share what we've been doing and, of course, the situation here in India. Um, so uh, it is fairly complicated. Uh, the question that you've asked me, and this is only from the perspective of what I definitely know uh, on the ground. So there are multiple levels of, uh, you know, uh, issues that we're dealing with. There is on one level a weak healthcare infrastructure that cannot really uh, take care of the rising second wave that happened in the last couple of weeks. So obviously that's affecting uh, the capacity of the healthcare workers. Uh, what they can deliver. Uh, there is, of course, lack of uh, equipment, material, uh, the right kind of resources that, that needs access to. Um, there is, of course, uh, other political issues uh, that are there on ground uh, because of which there are there is a bunch that is happening from a uh, black market perspective. The economy is down. There is, uh, of course, uh, all those kind of issues. So it's a very complicated social, economic, political, 
a healthcare crisis that we were sort of facing all together, right? And uh, from what I think all of you have been reading as well, it is uh, definitely pretty great. So uh, I think, um, of course, uh, and because of that, uh, there are multiple levels of challenges that we are facing on the ground, especially from a healthcare perspective. So there's lack of vaccinations. Uh, there is, uh, you know, again, lack of uh, a lot of uh, readily available resources that everybody needs to also recover. Uh, but now in all of this chaos, there are a bunch of other things that are happening to sort of streamline different pieces of this larger uh, crisis that is uh, that India is facing. So one piece of it where everyone is really working hard is on the oxygen problem, which was the largest uh, thing that was happening in the last couple of weeks because oxygen was something that was not available. Um, the cylinders which were there, they're not able to move supply chain issues. You can't move between states, so you can't transport. So a lot of that. Uh, and then of course, uh, there was a whole movement uh, in the last couple of weeks where we started bringing in a lot of oxygen concentrators so that we could sort of support with the oxygen problem. Uh, and because of that, there has been a lot of relief, but there's also have been other issues that are coming up like rightly pointed out by Joe as well in his previous conversation, we're talking about um, you know, how these equipments are coming in, they're getting pretty uh, spoiled pretty quickly how there's nobody there on the ground to repair them because nobody has the insights on how to do that. The healthcare workers are obviously in the middle of all of this while they are also getting affected by COVID. So, so I mean, I think that what I can possibly put down as a little summary of what is going on. Uh, but I think what is really um, great is that uh, everyone, a lot of uh, the community has gotten together to really be resilient in this time. And I think uh, that's what has been the primary focus for the last couple of uh, weeks to help each other out, uh, get as many resources as we can, do what we can best to really tackle the situation. And I think there's a lot of foreign aid that is coming in. Uh, everyone has been discussing about this problem everywhere. And I think, uh, I think the second wave is getting a little better, but there's obviously an expectation of a third wave that is going to come in, which is going to be higher than the first and between the second. So there, there are other uh, conversations around that. So that's pretty much the summation of what is going on on the ground at the moment. Liz, I'd like to turn to you. You, you were recently quoted uh, in a Guardian article uh, about the emphasis of planning and the fact that what we're seeing in India is largely going to be a domino effect. Can you tell us a bit more about the perspective of healthcare planning and why it's not just about uh, as simple as saying, you know what, India as a country has enough oxygen that it can produce, it's just a massive scale we're dealing with. So before I answer that, I just want to share some numbers so we, we sort of understand the scale of what we're talking about here. So I think on latest count, this is confirmed cases to the WHO, India has 28 million confirmed COVID cases about 320,000 deaths and every day, and this is the number that gets me, every day almost 4,000 people dying. Now we don't know what proportion of that 4,000 is due to lack of oxygen, but a lot, it's a lot. So oxygen now, uh, lack of access to it is a major driver of COVID-19 case fatality rates in India and other places. So why is this happening? If you zoom out, you have to take a look at the way governments, particularly governments, because they're responsible for you know, health, the health of the citizenry, invest in respiratory care broadly. So despite the disease burden of respiratory infections and chronic diseases, you know, pneumonia, COPD, pr prior to COVID, uh, respiratory infections and, and illnesses were a huge and massive cause of death. But very few governments were investing in prevention, diagnosis and treatment of respiratory conditions. So they were all vulnerable to begin with. Um, and, and that's um, the responsibility of governments, but it's also a weakness of the global health community because the global health community has been very focused on HIV AIDS, on TB, on malaria, on vaccination, there's been a few key things that the global health community has been responsible for and financing and the rest is sort of a, a, a black hole. So respiratory infections were neglected prior to COVID. So a lot of countries across the global South 
we're not investing in oxygen or any of the other things you need, uh, technologies you need like ventilators and pulse oximeters and high flown nasal cannula, all the, the kind of ecosystem of respiratory and care products were not priorities for any health system. Okay, so they're vulnerable to begin with COVID hits and all of a sudden the hospitals have waves of patients arriving who need a pulse oximetry reading. They, they may need oxygen and there's no equipment there but there's also no healthcare staff who, who have familiarity with that technology. So um, it was a kind of nightmare scenario that we knew what, what we knew it would happen because our coalition pre-exists COVID and we've been working on these issues for a very long time. So at the, at the very basic level, it's a failure to prioritize respiratory care technologies and all the things you're talking about today. And our hope is that COVID changes that fundamentally, that governments and all their partners will understand they need to prioritise access to these respiratory care technologies from the tiniest pulse oximeter through to the most sophisticated ventilator, because this is probably, although this is the first uh, pandemic of, uh, at scale that we're seeing in respiratory infections, the scientists are saying it's not going to be the last and it's probably not going to be the worst. So there's only going to be an increased need for these kind of technologies, which is why what you're doing, what your community is doing is so vital because we need new generation technologies that are made locally, designed locally, um, so that we don't have um, dependence. You know, what we've seen in the global south is this massive dependence on the north for the, for the machines to be shipped at huge cost to the south and they break quickly and there's no one, all that. All that is a result of this inequality between you know, where things are made, who makes them, who owns them, who can determine prices and the vulnerability of the lower middle income countries. So we do need a bit of a power flip here. Uh, and the maker community, I think, is going to be one of the groups that's going to need to force, make that change because there's no incentives for the big multinationals to make that change. Richard, your group has, has really been at the forefront of, of filling a technical gap in the biomedical manufacturing sector. What challenges would you say have been the biggest ones to overcome at 5,000 feet at ground level? We've talked about price, we've talked about patents. Um, you know, just we were just on calls in the past week where you know the cost of ventilators in different countries has increased from $3,000 to $35,000 a ventilator. And we're not talking about an open source ventilator, we're talking about something that is supposed to be uh, usable in an IC scenario. Uh, we've also been seeing uh, news reports in India, and yourself, Veva, commented on it earlier in his technical track about the huge swath of ventilators that were coming from China that were of extremely poor quality and are breaking. What are the challenges you're seeing uh, in trying to, to tackle this beast on the ground? Um, so, I mean, uh... What we're doing from a perspective of making a product, obviously there are multiple cycles to itself, right? There's design iteration, you have to test out materials, uh, you have to uh, change uh, using user feedback. You know, in the previous uh, talk as well, Pierre was talking about how user feedback is important. So at this point, when you're really making something from scratch, which is not being made in the country before this, all of these things become uh, one, uh, uh, a process of the design cycle, but at the, at, and second, what is happening at the same time is that you need something, all of these things to happen pretty quickly, pretty fast. So I think that's one of the major things that obviously uh, drives a lot of pressure into this, you know, making, but at the same time, it also, you know, really helps um, make the process agile. Having an open distributed network of individuals who do understand local environments, their settings, their local ecosystems is so important at this point because somebody sitting in, you know, some even if I was sitting somewhere else and, you know, ha having to do this uh, design of a, of a product, which is possibly a, a, a high-end medical equipment, uh, there's a lot that goes into it. Even if when last year, when we started the whole initiative, we were doing face shields and we had to go through 21 design iterations of that little one product. And just to you know, say the least, that was a primary you know, protective shield, which was absolutely uh, the opposite spectrum of you know, doing an oxygen concentrator, right? which is actually gonna go on to patients. It will has a potential to save lives. So there's a lot of things that uh, need to be taken care of. It is an equipment that does have certain level of 
um, you know, um, machining required, electrical knowledge required, electronics knowledge required. So there is certain kind of specific skill that you need. And all of it, uh, when, when we do it in an open, innovative and openly uh, open environment, what is happening is the agility of this product uh, development is way higher than independently somebody really approaching this. It could be a large manufacturer, it could be somebody else in the country, but at the same time, the same process of research and design goes into play. So when you really open up this whole ecosystem and have more people contribute to these from a local perspective a lot of things become really uh, great and exciting because that's what we're seeing so one challenge is of course the agility understanding all this design cycle in that short time because you have say two weeks or three weeks like oxygen concentrators were not made in two three weeks when they were made for you know medical level uh, usage they were made over years there have been so much work that has gone into it and when you're doing that in that short cycle I think What's appreciative about the fact is that while, of course, we're dealing with a lot of supply chain issue, resourcing problems, uh, getting user feedback, people not wanting to, you know, use them as well when you give it to them sometimes because, you know, of regulatory issues, uh, a lot of it, uh, I think, uh, becomes really exciting as well at the same time. But of course, there's a lot that is going on at the time. So having a larger group that is working together makes this process really, uh, really, I think, in the chaos, there's a lot of streamlining because we're learning on the go every day because we do these calls that we host every day. We're doing engineering calls, we're doing certification calls, we're doing um, you know sourcing calls. Uh, and I think that's, that's a very beautiful ecosystem that I don't think that happens in a closed innovation cycle. And despite all of that, I think what we've done in the last two, three weeks, we've actually made concentrators, 20 of them in different parts of the country, which are now going into you know, testing on the ground, which are all made using locally uh, available parts that are all done in other local ecosystems where whatever was available to them, they've used and done it, right? So. Uh, it's beautiful, it's challenging at the same time, but the, there is a lot of hindrance that comes in from governments. Uh, there's also a lot of things around, uh, you know, things getting uh, the price gouging, which is a big issue that happens with material sourcing. So all of this is becoming, uh, it becomes a complicated problem because at the end of the day, you know, these parts, et cetera, all manufactured outside, you know, most of them, uh, you don't have access to manufacturers in India and the manufacturers in India want to keep that, you know, uh, from a closed innovation perspective, you want to keep those things to yourself. You don't want to share and that, you know, the inequality arises from that perspective. But if it were open innovation environments from the beginning, there's so much more that we could have done in terms of access to this open health, because at the end of the day in India, pricing is very key, right? Because at the, you and I, we all can afford these concentrators, you know, $400, $500. I mean, it's not that difficult for us. But what about the people in the rural areas? And if you empower them with the skills to make it, I think that's a more powerful story uh, that we're definitely trying to sort of really pilot and establish because that's going to change the way healthcare can get access in India, especially in the rural areas of the country, where you have empowered people with the knowledge and skills, not only to make them, but you can fix them, you can make more things. And that goes beyond just, uh, you know, uh, funding people just to, you know, give them equipment that they possibly will not use in one month's time because they don't know how to use them, they don't know how to repair them. So what we're trying to do is sort of create that larger network of not only just makers and builders, but these guys who can be self, you know, support to the frontline workers, support to the ecosystems locally. So yeah, that's where we're at. <laughs> Brilliant. And so you, you talked a bit about the certification calls that you have. How do you address design choice and quality assessment for open source solutions that you're designing in your community in, in, in all these different environments? And, and, you know, we've talked about humidity and dirt control uh, as one classic challenge. Um, and, and we've talked earlier on when we were looking at the presentations in the technical track about how sensitive zeolite is uh, as, a, as a component. Now, how do you deal with that when you're dealing with not the same level of regulatory rigor and you're trying to bring speed to value, speed to development, you know, cut, cut red tape, cut corners in some case, not, in the, not from the standpoint of quality, but from the standpoint of efficacy and empathy of the design to cater to a diverse demographic. As you've rightly pointed out, we might be able to go and afford these devices at a higher price end but the majority in India is not at that bracket. And, and what yeah. do you do? 
we've also got power conditions that need to be catered into. No, I think uh, uh, they're, they're, the regulatory elements, uh, I think what's been hard of at least the way the uh, we've approached this is definitely been the human centered nature of the design, right? Because at the end of the day, it's the user, the end user that will use it. So somebody who is uh, the patient, uh, the healthcare workers who are gonna use this equipment are very important to this entire design process for us. Uh, so that regular feedback on the design is something I think that we go by. Now, regulatory approvals, et cetera, of course, lie on processes, how you make it, what kind of materials that you source, the quality assurance and the quality check relies completely on that. But for most equipment that you buy off the shelf and if you put it together, most of them do have ISO certifications or whatever that they need in terms of a process of uh, making. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you're putting up a device, I think what's been very key to us is the user feedback. And I think that is something that we've been constantly working on the ground with. So um, having to work with the hospitals, the frontline workers, for example, for the last two, three days, we've been having uh, doctors come in to actually test out the equipment at the space because they need to see it. They need to know how to use them. They need to be uh, they need to also tell us what is available locally in the hospitals, which doesn't work for them. For example, say a power issue, or do you have compressed air that we can put it into the system directly? All of those kinds of constraints which are there on, you know, because different hospitals are different types. There are private hospitals with great infrastructure. Sometimes there are government hospitals that don't even have like basic things. Like, for example, one of the key things that we were also seeing is that zeolite, yes, the humidity is a massive issue. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, and that's the reason why the humidifier that we've added to the uh, to the whole uh, system, which obviously acts really well, because in Goa, there's actually 90% humidity, which is uh, crazy because uh, you need to have at least less than 10% humidity for the concentrator to work really well, right? So there's all those kind of challenges. And then, um, so I think the user feedback has been very key for us. And I think that's what been keeping us uh, going last couple, even over the last year that we've been really focusing on is at the end user. And I think that makes a lot of sense because regulatory uh, certifications, et cetera, do come in from process standpoint and the quality of the equipment standpoint. But at the end of the day, the user has to use it. So if you're getting the right amount of oxygen output, the concentration and the LPM that they need in an ICU setting, I think that's what's key for us to make this happen. Uh, and then I think one of the other things that we're working on is actually defining uh, a QA QC process for a distributed network. So for example, say you're sitting in a lab somewhere in a rural part of the country. What are the, what is the range of things that you can sort of range of range of constraints that you can play with is going to be very key because at the end of the day, you might not get the same, you know, kind of equipment over there. So what is the range that you can play with? So now we, we do have the Cambridge University on board that we've been working with to get that piece of the puzzle sort of sorted. We do, uh, we're working with Fab Foundation in the United States and a few other organizations as well to see whether they can bring in their research inputs and do that. Uh, so, I mean, I think the idea of being in an interdisciplinary group of people that bring in different perspective of regulatory making, uh, all of that makes a big role in terms of the agility of this whole process. And I think that's what we're trying to really harness at this point. Leith, um, you know, one of the things that we seem to have seen time and time again, and I want to touch on the point you were making about the disparities between the global north and the global south. Um, when we've sort of looked at the specs as people have been expanding outreach to the global north for support is we need things that are military grade versus medical grade. Now to many people, it's, it's very difficult to understand what the difference is. Can you shed some light on what you've been seeing in your interactions and how can we demystify the distinction? Is it in fact a distinction or is it a distraction? Um, so I think there's, um, there's a problem in pandemics with sticking hard and fast to the letter of the law. <laughs> um, let me explain what I mean by that. Um, lots of rules and regulations around medical devices for safety reasons, you know, the WHO has an enormous list of them um, and they can become a barrier um, to saving lives in a pandemic. So I am in the camp that says in an emergency, we have a different modus operandi. We do things differently and everybody should um, expect that. If you wanna save lives, you have to cut some, cut some corners. So I've seen um, a lot of uh, products that 
can't quite make it, can't quite check all the boxes in terms of the stringent regulatory requirements, but they might be just fine to save lives over the next 12 months, but they never make it into, into and so people, you know, people die as a result of that kind of thing. It's very hard though, to get the official organizations to relax their rules and regulations. It's something these vast bureaucracies really can't do. So what do you do? Um, the conclusion I've reached is that uh, investments need to be made in maker communities because you can challenge the status quo. So I, and we haven't done that very well in the pandemic. That sort of had two systems running in parallel, all the official channels of support through the UN agencies and the governments like US government, all the other European governments, basically buying vast quantities of technologies from multinational companies, putting them on airplanes or ships and shipping them to India and hoping that it's all kind of going to work out. That's, that's the standard MO. And the only things that make it in, onto those ships are things with FDA or CE. They're very expensive. They're overpriced. They get, they're more expensive now than at, ever before. And people just pay and put them in. Um, and there's not the equivalent effort that goes into investing in local efforts, uh, as we just heard Richard talk about. So they're always struggling for cash. They're always bootstrapping. They're doing whatever they can do. Um, so I wish these two separate tracks could be, there could be a big bridge between the two of them during pandemics. And the official channels would relax their rules and regulations to, to enable the maker communities to have a greater impact. So get their technologies developed and out there as quickly as possible. Um, you do as, you do as, you're as careful as you can be, but as soon as you err on the side of these stringent rules, we have all these great devices just sitting there and it could be years and years before they ever see it, you know, into a hospital. And that really bothers me. So let's, let's, I, think a big gap, I was just going to say, I think a big gap though, is that, uh, uh, sorry, my, my video is off just to say, end with a little bit, but, uh, the gap is that the big buyers and the money and the channels for procurement and scaling of technology all relies on those certain uh, requirements. So I'm not sure how to create the bridge between those two things. I, I think one thing that we're trying to do with, with UNICEF and the Oxygen Collab is to bring the innovators to the table with the manufacturers to try to solve some of the challenges. And uh, actually, if I can go on a little spiel here, what I was thinking, uh, hearing all of this is that um, I wanna encourage the maker community to actually be better than uh, what the industry is doing right now don't necessarily follow the, the same way that, uh, and do the same design that the current commercial devices are being designed as. And to explain this a little more, so I think that we know the challenges with devices are kind of in these four buckets of power, humidity, and, and environmental issues, usability, and uh, I guess you could say repairability. In a lot of ways, that's because the, the devices on the, on the market right now are not designed for these use environments and use cases and users. Um, even if you look at the ISO standards, for example, I learned just yesterday when I was reading it for concentrators, the concentrator is not considered a life-sustaining device. Uh, you tell that to somebody in India right now on a concentrator or a, a neonate in, in Africa somewhere that's hooked up to a concentrator that is not a life-sustaining device, that's crazy. And consequently, even the, the low purity alarms on the devices, according to the ISO standards, uh, it's a low priority alarm. Again, that's kind of absurd when you think of the use case in a place like India or uh, East Africa or wherever. So, uh, it's again, a challenge that, same thing with usability, there's a bunch of challenges to design for these settings. And, and one way I, I talked about this morning in the session was to follow the standards and, the, for example, the target product profile that's pushed out by UNICEF and, and WHO and other groups. Um, that sets the requirements for these specific low resource settings and what those environments and users need. So that when we're designing or you're designing as makers, you can, you can target that need um, and not just reinvent and make open source what industry is doing today because that is not meeting the need. Um, so that's it, thank you. Uh, and Liz, I, I, wanted, I wanted to deep dive on, on something you'd mentioned a little earlier when you were talking about impact. Um, and a bit, I guess this is a bit of a two part question. Number one, we're gonna be cutting corners if we want to be rapidly innovating in the, in the case of a pandemic. How do you effectively measure impact in the situation? What is the metric that stands above? Or if we have to reshuffle the current metrics or the traditional metrics, 
what do they need to be, be focused on? Uh, and the second part of this is really piggybacking of what uh, Florian just said, how can the maker community work more effectively with the international COVID response, specifically the ACT-A Oxygen Response Task Force with WHO, UNICEF, Global Fund, World Bank, and others? And there is access to funding that is now being made available. Can you share some light on that? Yeah, so the first question is metric. So I guess in the, the only metric that really matters to me when we talk about respiratory care technologies is COVID-19 case fatality rates. So once you're very sick and you're in a hospital in an ICU and you're trying to survive, it's measuring that by hospital by hospital, the COVID-19 case fatality rate, and then to have some kind of national estimate of that. If all these technologies we're developing, including the oxygen work, you know, we should be able to see over time those case fatality rates come down, which is what we saw in America and Europe. Initially, they were very bad because the staff didn't know what to do with COVID, but they got better at it. And over time, um, you saw the COVID case fatality rates in the European and US ICUs come down. And I'm sure we'll be seeing that too in the global south. But that's the ultimate measure, is that very sick patients with COVID survive. Um, so that's, that's uh, with vaccine, you know, you have a whole different set of met metrics about preventing transmission. But for me, it's, it's reducing those deaths from, from COVID. We've had 3.5 million deaths globally from COVID, and there's no sign that this is slowing. So it's really a global tragedy. Um, in terms of ACT A, so for people who don't know, there is an international oxygen emergency response. Um, it's relatively new. It was launched in February this year. It's called the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator. That's the ACT bit, ACT A, oxygen emergency response. So the international uh, COVID support has uh, four pillars. There's a vaccine pillar, a diagnostics, a therapeutics, and something called health system strengthening. Oxygen sits within therapeutics, as it should. And this task force is co-chaired by a UN agency called UNITAID, which is part of the World Health Organization, and the Wellcome Trust, which many of you may know as a big funder in, in health. Um, our group sits on that, and Florin, who spoke before UNICEF, UNICEF is a big part of that group, and many others. So they're responsible, really, for helping countries finance their oxygen needs. So we know a lot of the governments have not had enough money to pay for all of these things that they need. So the task force is, is helping them finance um, liquid oxygen, um, oxygen plants, PSA, VSA plants, and concentrators, and pulse oximeters, and all the other accessories and consumables that go with it. So countries now have more funding than ever before to, to procure those technologies. But what will they be procuring? They'll be procuring all the standard stuff that you see coming in by donation. Will they be procuring or accelerating innovations like the stuff that's coming out of the maker community? That's a really good question. And we really need to get the maker community together with the task force to have that conversation. You know, How are you going to invest in innovation, if at all? Um, Florin mentioned before, there's a group called the Oxygen Collab that's separate to the ACT Accelerator Task Force that's funded by the UK government. That's certainly somewhere where you should be. But in terms of ACT-A, I think, I think as a result of this conversation today, as a result of Respicon, we might try and get the ACT-A Task Force together with some of you from this group to have that conversation. It's something I'd love to do. <laughs> Rob's got his thumbs up. I love the way people do this on this forum. I'm going to take this on. I love it. <laughs> um, can I jump in with with, uh, with two really quick thoughts? Um, one is that um, I think another thing we can do, though, even though we're saying that the existing funding is for buying the traditional concentrators and some of these innovations aren't fitting into those pipelines. So I'm going to close my window. There's, it's garbage day here. There we go. Um, the one thing that we can do that I think is really important to do is to help drive demand and procurement of good concentrators and the high quality ones that will resist. And the problem, um, having spent the last three months with the Oxygen Collab, diving deep into the problems and like several layers deep into what is the true cause of that problem and failure, I've come to realize that concentrators look the same on the surface, but they're vastly different in how they're designed and how they'll perform. And there's a number of design decisions and their design histories of those specific products that will lead to either success or like very rapid failure. But that's really not hard to tell, not easy to tell to a buyer or a user. And so I think um, something I'm focused on is, is developing content and materials that will help buyers make the decision to buy the right kind of concentrators that will live up to the test of time. Um, 
that, that's one thing I think we can do. And then the second thing is, um, like we said, getting involved in this oxygen collab movement, I think that's another way to bridge the gap between innovators and the innovation space that's trying to resolve these problems and industry, because I think industry does not have the capacity or the interest uh, to innovate for the most part. There are some companies that are quite innovative, but um, for the most part, not so much. I think the innovation capacity in the industry in the last decade has probably shifted away from innovative R&D and more towards cost engineering and value engineering. And so um, through the work of the collab, uh, I think that's a way to really solve some of those problems that we can all adopt as innovators, but also then push forward to industry to adopt. So again, I'm just gonna very self-promotingly here plug that you should all be involved in the Oxygen Collab open challenges that are launching in a couple of weeks, because those are focused on the biggest problems that we've identified and the biggest, most promising potential solutions. And there's grant funding um, for all of you to try to solve some of those problems and fill those evidence gaps and run experiments for the Collab. I just just one final question here. We are going to be at time. Um, Richa, I want to ask you, we, we've heard from Florin and from Leith on uh, what the maker community can do, what sort of role they have to play. From your perspective on the ground, what can everybody else do to support the maker community in India? What do you need? I think uh, what we do need is definitely funding. And I think that's going to be the big driver for actually supporting a lot of these maker spaces and labs locally. Because at the end of the day, uh, what we saw in the last uh, wave as well was there was a, there was a global maker community that got together without any reason, but was making and making and supporting not only in India but across the world. This was in France. This was in U.S. It was in Italy. It was everywhere else. Uh, but a couple of months down the line, uh, none of them had funding. Uh, some of them could figure out ways to do other things and get things going. Uh, a lot of us did figure out different business model, models around it and things like that. But I think at the end of the day, the funding dried out and that's how it dried out a lot of these efforts, which actually contributed to over $200 million worth of uh, work that came in from the open source community globally. So which is significant amount of, you know, uh, work that was done in a collaborative open manner. So I think the funding is going to be very key to support not only just donate these devices, but to support these labs with funds to make them, to help them skill themselves, to really uh, push them forward so that they can make more things. Because at the end of the day, if we're not making locally, if we're not self-sufficient, if we don't uh, support our local ecosystems and our local makers, I think uh, the resilience for the future is going to be something which is going to be tricky, at least in India, is what we think. And even globally, I think, because everywhere else, you do need innovation to intersect with uh, the needs and the image it needs sometimes, especially when it comes to healthcare environments. And like, you know, Leith was saying earlier, very rightly, that most of these innovations sit at people's home and their labs and, then, and don't go out when you really need them because they can. If you don't put in the barrier of stringent regulation, sometimes they can still save lives. And that's what is very key uh, to this whole movement, to empower people with that skill to actually do more things rather than just funding and supporting, you know, donations coming in from outside for, you know, high grade equipment, uh, which I feel, uh, uh, you know, sort of serves the purpose, but only for a very short term agenda. Thank you very much, Robert. How are we doing with time? Do we have any time for questions? No, I'd like to. No, we don't. 